in the Christopher Street area, village area, we were more or less free to be ourselves. But people could still come along and jump out of the car with baseball bats and beat us up. And if we go to another part of New York, even the West Village, we could get beat up easily. Once you're in the stone wall, nothing bad would ever happen to you. And you could dance with each other. There was no, no social structures for gay people back then at all, nothing. The stone wall was the only place where we could be ourselves without being beat up or anything. Welcome back to the Hyperallergic Podcast. As we start up the show again after an 18-month hiatus, it just so happens that this is our 100th episode. So thank you to everyone who's listened to the previous 99, and welcome to all newcomers, as we'll continue to explore the sometimes wonderful and always weird terrain of the art world together. Today, we're going to be talking with Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, a revered collage and mixed-media artist, who makes fantastical sculptures out of saran wrap, glitter, and tin foil. In his work, which blends worlds that span from his childhood in the working class Catholic world of Linden, New Jersey, to his flowering in gay New York street culture, he is often transforming plasticky materials, so often considered tacky, garish, or cheap, and makes them as precious as gold. He is also one of a handful of people still alive today who are present and active in the 1969 Stonewall Uprising, often called the Stonewall Riots. We think you're going to like what he has to share, and that young artists, especially young queer artists, can learn a lot from his story. But first, let's ground ourselves in this point of time in history. Anne Bossom is the author of Stonewall, Breaking Out in the Fight for Gay Rights, a guide to Stonewall history specifically made for teens. Both her and Tommy pointed out that Stonewall was one point in time in the enormous civil rights movement or, more accurately perhaps, civil rights movements that were taking place in this country as oppressed groups fought for equality all across the United States. We wanted to share a bit of Anne's personal history to give context of what was happening here and what the 1960s in the United States was actually like. I'm Harag Vartanyan, host of the Hyperallergic podcast and the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Hyperallergic. Let's get started. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So happy to, to see you and get to have this conversation. Awesome. Well, I just want to first of all start with, I just want to pronounce your name correctly, Anne Awesome. Is that correct? Exactly. My dad used to say rhymes with awesome. So <laughs> that's actually really great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. So can you tell me a little bit about your own personal experience? You talked a little bit about your schooling, and I would wondered whether you could talk a little bit about that. So I was born in Tennessee in the late 1950s, and my family moved to Virginia when I entered second grade. And I, I received the rest of my education through high school in the state of Virginia. And the first two years of that were in segregated schools. By fourth grade, Virginia, so this is like 1966, Virginia had finally run out of excuses to fight the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education ruling. So they'd managed to, to add 12 years to the implementation of that statewide. And um, so I don't always share this story, but my parents were either then or later college professors. They were educated people who had Southern roots but had had a, gotten a lot of their education beyond the South and would be have been considered very progressive, you know, not just by that standard, but by today's standards. And so in 1966, when schools were integrated in my hometown, Lexington, Virginia, I, I was later told by my parents that the word went around the parent circle that... Um, what you should do is you should put in a teacher request for Anne, and that way she will end up in a classroom that has a white teacher. And my parents were like, well, that doesn't sound like integration. So they didn't put in a teacher request. So I was one of three, as I understand, white kids in a classroom that had the only African-American, a black teacher, the only African-American teacher in fourth grade, Mrs. Warren. And... I loved fourth grade. I loved Mrs. Warren, but I also only later learned that when my school district had set up 
those classrooms, the African-American teachers had been segregated in a different part of the building. And those classrooms, other classrooms also were predominantly black for the same reason that mine was. And those classrooms ran on a different bell schedule for lunch and recess. And so I was isolated from the friends that I had known from previous grades. And I've been told that my father, who is a very calm person, went to the school board and spoke sternly enough that that practice ended almost immediately. And our classroom was roofed. I do remember that happening. And our bell schedules aligned so that I was with the other fourth graders. So I didn't begin to understand all the background that was going on and all of that. But I think it's understandable that that was a decade that I would turn to, to want to understand better as an adult. Well, thank you, Anne. So could you tell us a little bit about what the actual significance of Stonewall was for the civil rights movement and for the LGBTQ plus movement in general? The events at Stonewall were not the first statement in support of LGBTQ rights in the United States, gay rights, but it was a pivotal moment because it gathered together a critical mass of people all at once, all at the same time, in common cause, expressing their absolute um, impatience with the pace of change in relation to queer people in America and their determination to resist and it assert their their rights to be considered equally along with other civil rights that were being looked at at that era. Right. And what do you think is sanitized or oversimplified about Stonewall? Um, what, <laughs> what do you think? What do you think that is? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you want to give me? <laughs> <laughs> so the context of the Stonewall riots is often mischaracterized as uh, a reaction to a police raid on a, a gay bar because um, you weren't allowed to have gay bars in 1969. And that's actually not accurate. The right of queer people to gather in bars had already been established by 1969. The right of them to dance together in public settings like a gay bar had already been established by 1969. And so the Stonewall riots followed a police raid that actually had nothing whatsoever to do with gay rights directly. It was in response to a um, criminal bribery scheme that was taking place at places like the Stonewall and other gay bars, almost all of which were being run by the mob, by the mafia, and who realized that they could take advantage of patrons who were comfortable going to the Stonewall and other gay bars, but who were closeted in other aspects of their life, particularly professionally. And that some of those people included traders on Wall Street who were being blackmailed and forced to maintain their anonymity by turning over securities that were then being traded illegally in the European market and were being traced back to these bars in lower Manhattan. And so the police raid was tied into this um, I think I used the word bribery before, but it was a blackmail scheme that was going on at the time. So I don't know if that relates exactly to your question of how we oversimplify things. Oh, no, but... I think it's a perfect example of how we oversimplify things, actually, because I think that's not something that people often talk about. Right. You know, and, and so the, the, it being is a blackmail scheme changes it, right? <laughs> well, yeah. But the fact that you could be blackmailed because you were gay right. then helps to bring it back again to center. And the fact that the raid triggered this response among patrons and others, other passers-by to protest so vehemently also takes it back to the, the center of the matter, which is that LGBTQ people in America were being oppressed everywhere they turned. So what was the actual, the police's official reasoning to raid the bar? Okay, so the Stonewall fell within what was known as the 16th Precinct in um, New York cop world. But the raid was conducted by those officers. In fact, they didn't even know the raid was going to happen. It was a, an extra plan that was executed by the public morals 
of the police department that operated independently. And this was under the request or the order that these bars be shut down so that this, these illegal securities would no longer be being passed around. And uh, Seymour Pine, who was the deputy inspector for that NYPD public morals office, organized the raid, but it was complicated to try to prove the the blackmailing scheme, but it was relatively easy to prove that the Stonewall Inn, which had opened uh, at a time when gay bars still were illegal, uh, it, it had opened with a different kind of liquor license than your, your basic bar. It was called a bottle club. And that liquor lice, license uh, to Seymour Pine, it was pretty clear that was being violated. And so that was an easy way to shut down a bar like the Stonewall Inn was to raid the bar, collect evidence that they really weren't running it like a bar bottle club. And a bottle club was basically a, a private club where, you, you know, Ann Bossom and Harag had their bottles behind the counter and we were members and we paid fees and we could go in and get a pour if um, we wanted to be with our buddies. So they, they planned to raid the Stonewall Inn and collect evidence that proved that it was violating its, its um, liquor license and that would allow them to close it down. It didn't really matter how they got that outcome. They just wanted to shut it down. Got it. So now who were some of the significant figures that were at the Stonewall riots? One of the people who did find himself at the Stonewall was a musician, Dave Von Ronk. He's the, the historical figure that is said to have been the inspiration for the Inside Llewellyn film that, that came out, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe. And so Dave Von Ronk happened to walk in front of the Stonewall Inn at a pivotal moment when it was clear that the crowd that was gathering at the inn was not going to disperse on its own and that indeed it was becoming more violent. And so um, Seymour Pine, the inspector who had led the raid, had by then emptied most of the patrons out of the bar and chose to retreat into it to, to try to uh, remain safe while they waited for reinforcements to come, which, by the way, did not really want to show up because they would have been coming from the 16th precinct, which was pretty ticked off that this raid had happened. Oh, and also, by the way, the mob would pay bribes and so forth. But there were there were payments under the table to the 16th precinct officers and other officers to leave these bars alone. So in any case, help was not arriving. The things were getting out of hand, and at one point, von Ronk happens to be standing there as. The, the door opens to try to respond to some of this chaos that's going on outside. And they just grabbed him and brought him inside. And, and he ended up getting beaten and um, handcuffed to a radiator, as I recall, and was one of the unwilling or unwitting uh, participants to the riots from the inside of, of the club. Wow. That's, that's incredible. I mean, I can only imagine this, you know, what kind of experience that would have been. And so, of course, also among those witnessing the Stonewall riots and then participating in them was Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, who was just a, 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 you know, a teen still at that time, a young man who had come to New York as a runaway, as so many queer people did, looking to find his, his um, adopted family, which he did, and looking to find places to feel at home, of which the Stonewall Inn was absolutely one. And so he was not in the bar when it was raided, but he became aware of the raid very early on and was an active participant in the mob response to the raid. We are, we're so in it. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Anne. Thanks so you much. Bet, you bet. You bet. All right. Take care. Appreciate it talking. Good to meet you. And now come with us to Hell's Kitchen as we talk to the artist himself. Come up the stairs with me as we go to his fifth floor walk up where he's been living for decades. We sat together in among his floor-to-ceiling stacks of books, albums, journals, newspapers, and of course his glittery artwork. It was like walking through a portal into another world. He talked about growing up in New Jersey, running away from home as a teen, gay street life in New York in the 60s and 70s, and his contact with artists including Jack Smith, Charles Ludlam, and Andy Warhol, and of course, talk about Stonewall. Having to lie, I feel, is, is the saddest 
And the ugliest part of being a homosexual, uh, when you have your first bad love experience, for instance, and you can't go to your brother or your sister and say, I'm hurting. At first, I was very guilty. And then I realized that all the things that are taught you not only by society, but by psychiatrists, just to fit you in a mold. And I've just rejected the mold, and when I rejected the mold, I was happier. What is the worst incident that has ever happened to you as far as being gay? Uh, I guess my parents, you know, them finding out was the worst. If nothing else, we're good for the population explosion. Can you tell me what you feel about the homophile movement? I think it's great. I think it's really dynamite. And I think the only way to achieve it is through force and marches like this. Can you tell me what you thought about Charlie Brown, the Sodom and Gomorrah guy carrying the American flag? He's a closet queen, and you can find him in Howard Johnson any night. And what color underwear did he wear? Pink. Thank you. So I'm here with Tommy Lanigan Schmidt and his apartment here in the theater district. Hi, Tommy. Hell's Kitchen. Oh, is this Hell's Kitchen? Is that what technically where we are? Well, right here is the border between the two. Got it. Okay. And you've been here since 1975. 75, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how the neighborhoods changed before we get into this topic. Well, this neighborhood is always, this part was always part of Hell's Kitchen and not part of Hell's Kitchen because it borders on Hell's Kitchen. So when I moved here, it was still mostly like Irish Catholic Democrat right. and a gang called the Westies that ran, ran the neighborhood more or less. And uh, I was a member of the McManus Democratic Club, which is my grandmother taught me to join the local political party club. So that was a, a, I don't know how to explain that, but that's like as close to a gang as I could get. (laughs) And you grew up in Linden, New Jersey, is that correct? New Jersey, yes. And tell me about that experience in terms of how it it influenced you, um, you know, politically. Linden, New Jersey is probably one of the most amazing places on earth because it's a place that is more liberal than most places and less liberal at the same time. I don't even know how to explain that. It's nothing like most other places. An example is, well, right now in Linden, there's a big Coptic church that was built in Linden, like probably within the past 20 years for Egyptian Coptic Christians. And like when it got dedicated, the Pope of the whole Coptic church for the whole world came to dedicate it in Linden, New Jersey. That's someone that gets to visit the Pope in Rome by just right. snapping his finger. <laughs> so that kind of gives you a sense of that, something about Linden. Linden is all, always all these different ethnic groups. Right. And it's always just when these ethnic groups are starting to get their feet on the ground, so to speak. Right. In other words, they're just starting to buy houses. And most of their children probably will move out and get bigger houses or other cities and things like that. And I remember you talking about it as kind of a buffer zone between different kinds of neighborhoods and well, whether it's... Yeah, yeah, well, the neighborhood I lived in was the buffer zone between the black and the white neighborhood. Because back back then, there was a, the United States had a kind of like real estate apartheid. Right. So if, if you, you when you went to buy a house... Uh, the real estate people would kind of harangue you about, like, not moving into a black neighborhood if you were white. And my father didn't like that, so we lived in a mixed neighborhood. Then you moved to New York. Well, the ne- moving to New York is, is a very special time for me, because first I went one semester to Pratt after high school. I went to Pratt in Brooklyn. I didn't have the, really the money to go back or anything. So when I went back home, my father got me a job on a ditch-digging crew. Now, that's like considered like working-class aristocratic, because it, it, it could segue into... Could be union. Could yeah, be all those right, things. Right. Union, any of those things. But what happened was, when I got there, I was so f- freaked out. I was like so petrified with something, fright or something, when I went to the place where the job was going to start, that I just came home to see my father. And he said, how did it go? I said, okay. And, but I was lying. And he said, here's, the, here's seven cents, go get the paper. So I said, okay. And then I went out and I walked down the corner and a friend of my brother's stopped in his car and said, are you going anywhere? I said, yeah, I'm going to Elizabeth. And I went to Elizabeth and got the train to New York. I only had 55 cents in my pocket. And I don't know how I did any of this when I think back on it. It's, I, mean, I just had very good luck or something. But did you just feel it? I mean, like, what? I, well, the thing was, I felt every... It's, I don't know how many... Most people get this 
feeling like not very many times in your life where you feel absolutely nothing and absolutely everything at the same time. Mm. It's the most focused, unfocused thought and feeling bunch you can have. And that's all I had when I left Linden, New Jersey. It went into like this kind of like narrow focus that I, I knew where I had to go. And I knew I had to get, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was just lucky I was so young because I didn't know anything about life. If I would have known more about life, I might have thought more about it. (laughs) But I didn't. And when I got here, somehow I managed to survive. And like, I would go back and forth to see my parents occasionally. And they could never deal with the gay gay part at all. But how did you survive? How did you decide to cobble a life together? And why was art the career path you chose? Well, art was always what I built everything around ever since I was a little boy. People always liked my art more than they liked me. So that was, my, <laughs> my art would always lead me more or less. It's, it's, a, it's, just, it's a thing that I survived through. And in Catholic school, I did the bulletin boards for all the way from the fifth grade through the eighth grade. And I was never in class because I was out, always outside doing these bulletin boards. So in a sense, I got used to being treated in, I guess what we call it, kind of a privileged way. And you seem to, art kind of led to that, it sounds well, like. Well, that was art already, because yeah. my art is, is just a natural continuity of those bull, bulletin right. boards. Right. And so when I came to New York, and Pratt was very important, too, because, like, at Pratt, they recommended books to read that I didn't know about at all, like Heinrich Wolflin and people like that. Right. And uh, But anyway, when I came to New York, I ran into people that knew, this is so crazy, that knew people that I knew, but I didn't really know them very well. And that was how I got, like, places to stay for, like, a night here and there. It was, like, such good luck. Because I did from June all the way to end of September, I didn't have any place to live. I would live here and there, here and there, here and there. And a lot of people were doing that back then. Right. Are you nostalgic for that time? Do you idolize that time? Like, idealize, I should say, that time? Or do you look back at it as sort of a difficult time? How do you see it now? Well, it's all those things, but it's a, it's a unique time because it's it's the end it's the end of the sixties. It's the mid sixties. I come to New York in sixty six, so it's the mid mid sixties going toward the end of the sixties. So the sixties is something that like um, was like no other era. It, it's it's like all the best things about what goes on now came out of the sixties, and all the best things that came out of the sixties came out of the thirties, and in the United States. So like uh, the sixties. When I came, there was Christopher Street was there, and that was the gay hangout. I'd never seen, like, gay culture before. I I just knew I was gay, but I didn't know anything about a culture that was gay. Right. And so when I went to Christopher Street, there was all these people my own age hanging out there and interweaving in and out with people from all over the country that were hanging out there. So it was the best place in the world to get a very good education. Yeah. So... You've talked about the fact that during that era, you were hanging out with a lot of other kids that, you know, didn't seem to fit in. Is it, would that be the accurate way of character? Well, or how would you say that? It would that? depend on what you mean by didn't, where they didn't fit in. They wouldn't have fit in where I grew up. They wouldn't have fit in where they grew up. But mm-hmm. they, they, they fit in with each other. Right. I mean, how did you all find each other? And were they artists as well? I would say they were all artists, but not a of them would say they were artists. Street life for gay people back then, especially gay teenagers, was, was wall-to-wall art. Because every everyone was on their own, and everyone was like had been like a reject from the world they came from, and the reason they were a reject was because they stood out because they uh, they molded a world and presented a world about themselves that everyone couldn't stand for the most part. Right. So that's a form of art. Absolutely. And then they come to New York, and we all meet each other, and we support each other, and we come into New York. We say like Jack Smith is already here, right. Charles Ludlam is already here. Right. And those people were in the streets hanging out mm. so we could meet them. Warhol had nothing to do with anything. Oh. See, people don't know, but Warhol back then was telling everyone he was asexual. Right. See, there's this crazy historical revision that goes on talking about Warhol being so gay and everything. Right. He would never admit he was gay back right. then. Well, I mean, and also he had all that weird stuff during the 80s, too, uh, during uh, AIDS. and the Like, he wasn't being very supportive, it sounded like, either of the gay community. Well, he was always like that. Okay. So that's not new. So it is kind of a little bit of historical revisionism yeah. about his queerness. But did you all know he was queer? Yes, we all knew. That's that's why we couldn't stand that he was playing this game ah. that that he was like he was telling everyone he was asexual because I knew lots of people that had sex with him. 
But then how about Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg no, and I stuff? I never met them. I just, I, I just went to like a party at like Rauschenberg's place. Once. But did they? But did people know who they were gay, yes, or did we they have a role never, as well? We knew they were gay, but they were never talked about with like hate or dislike toward them. They were just kind of. They weren't even regarded as talking about because they were. They weren't public like Warhol. So they were. They, they were like part of the art world. Warhol was part of the world and the art world. Right. And so now Stonewall, of course, is the big, um, the Stonewall uprising is one of the things people often talk to you about because Mm -hmm. you're very much part of that. Now, in retrospect, looking back, how would you describe the Stonewall uprising for people? Well, whenever I talk about the Stonewall uprising, I have to talk about how, why it happens. Right. Okay, now in the street, we were more or less, in the Christopher Street area, village area, we were more or less free to be ourselves. But people could still come along and jump out of the car with baseball bats and beat us up. And if we go to another part of New York, even the West Village, we could get beat up easily. Once you're in the stone wall, nothing bad would ever happen to you. Mm. And you could dance with each other. Now, there's a lot of people that love to look down on the stone wall and talk about how sleazy it was, but I loved the stone wall just because I could dance with my friends the same way I did at CYO, that was Catholic Youth Organization. And when, you, when you're at the, at the Stonewall, it was an era in the world where people ask each other to dance. Right. You didn't just jump up and start dancing. Right. And you could ask someone to dance, and then you got to know people that way. There was no, no social structures for gay people back then at all, nothing. Right. See, it's hard for people to realize that now because yeah, there's right. so many different places. Yeah, yeah. The Stonewall was the only place where we could be ourselves without being beat up or anything. I mean, there was, there was an old saying, I don't know if it was true then, but it was, what was it, the, the three Bs for gay people, bars, baths, and bookstores? Was that kind of true then? I think that's 70s. 70s, okay. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit later that's than this. Later, yeah. Okay. That's so once, that's, once time, that's once the sexual re- revolution gets its feet on the ground, that's, that's what happens. But, but until then, it was still just the bars, that a couple of bars that that people well, would socialize in? Well, back then, well, gay people had in New York had sex at a place called the Trucks. Right. The oh, tr- right, in the meatpacking district. The meat, that was just a bunch of trucks that during the day had transported different kinds of things, and at night they were parked there empty. So, like, they'd be all parked under, under the West Side Highway, and you just go there. And you walk in, it's so crazy, because you walk in, it's dark, and it's very easy to have sex in there. I didn't like having sex in there, because you couldn't see the other person. <laughs> I, I, sex for me is a very visual thing, but there I couldn't. But the funniest thing about the trucks was you're there, and you just see, like, two people, three people, four people, one, two, going in the trucks. Then the cops come along, and with the sirens going, rrr, 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 and, like, a thousand people run out of those trucks. It was like, when, I don't know if people do Clown that. cars. It was more like when you spray roaches. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen bugs yeah. when you could spray yeah, them. Yeah. And, and, like, it's a crazy metaphor. But, uh, I mean, but, <laughs> it's but, a very intense metaphor, I have to say. But that, I, I was crazy to see, like, so many people come out of those trucks when you thought there was maybe, like, ten people in there. Right. Right. And there was like maybe 150 people in there. So that would start after uh, those those companies closed, or would it be at nighttime? When well, it was... after dark. After dark. So now, were you at Stonewall when the police came and ra- raided? I was outside. And so, what was your first reaction? Well, my first reaction was like that it was a raid, but that they were trying to close a place that we could dance, so everyone fought back. Right. What was it about that day that people fought back? Or more importantly, why did you fight back? Because they were going to close a place where we could dance together. It was like the center of our lives was being was being tramped on. But there were other times that it was raided. So why was it that specific time? That was a Friday night, I think. That was a, a very it was it was a very populous night. It was also something about that night had a lot of things coming together. You know, there's the folklore about it be Judy Garland's funeral. That's, That's not true, that correct? Not, I'm one of those people who say it has nothing to do with anything. I couldn't stand that. I mean, I like Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, but I, I'm not a Judy Has Garland. To do with. No. Was there anything else in the air at the time that may have influenced that? The civil rights movement in general. Got it. It's, it's, it's part of the whole thing, right. of, of a whole decade of people getting their rights. Absolutely. So now... About that night, what do you remember now in retrospect the most? What has stand out? And what did you remember when it first happened? And now in retrospect, what do you think was a more significant or, or how do you remember it now? Well, how I remember it now is like, okay, I, re- I remember it. The, most, the strongest memory will happen if someone is using lighter fluid. I smell the lighter fluid and then without even thinking, 
I'll remember the stone wall because there were a lot of people like um, using lighter fluid, like putting it on newspapers and throwing them and things like that. At the time, I knew it was a big event, but I, I did, I, no one knew it was going to change history. And so now, is there something about that night that you that you think you still can't figure out? Well, that night is a lot like uh, the same feeling, similar to the feeling I had when I left home. It's one of those things that you can't, I can't, I don't know what other people can do, but I can't put it into any category of thinking. It's, it's, it's the fullest and the emptiest at the same time. I mean, I don't even know how to talk about that. Something that is so, so enormous that um, it's probably similar to, like, people who live during a war or something. Right, right. So that is a similar mood? Well, I, I would say people that live during a war probably have it worse. Right. I, they have, I'm sure they have it worse. But, but, like, those jolts and jars of not having life be like the coziness of when you were a little kid are, are like, um, tied together in me and the, the Stonewall because, like, um, I, again, I don't know how to talk about that. It, it changes everything so much. And but, but first of all, just going to the Stonewall to dance changed everything. Right. That's the most important thing to me, that we could dance with each other, and we couldn't dance with each other any other place. In other words, heterosexuals, they could go any place and dance, but we couldn't hold on to each other and dance any place, but we could do it there. It was, it was the only place that made us feel normal. Right. That makes sense. So now... Were there other artists at, at Stonewall during that night? Well, from that whole era, I don't remember that night, because that night is like thousands of people. Right. So, like, everyone's going to see it differently. But, sure. but like, the Stonewall was, like, uh, the center of gay life back then. So, like, uh, I would go there a lot with Chris Scott. Chris Scott was the boyfriend of Henry Gelzar, who was the curator at, at the Metropolitan Museum. And, and then there was someone named Eddie Shostak, who was a, an artist, too, and, like... A, Editors of like art form would be like Charlie Coles would go there. Mm. Is he still alive? I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> no, he would go there, and he was he was like um, he was like one of the older people I think paid for sex, and uh, so there are always a lot of art people there. And then there were like boxers, there like a bo- boxer named Emil Griffith would go there. He was very famous, but I didn't know who he was back then. He was famous because, and this should be in gay history, but it's never talked about. And I think it was in the mid earlier part of the 60s, the other box, he was, he was like a very important boxer, Emil Brick Griffith. He was way up there. And another boxer, it was called Benny Perrette, I think, called Emil Griffith a maricone, faggot. Wow. And Emil Griffith that night was to box him, and he beat him to death. Wow. And so, I mean, I think that's very significant. But like... You know, middle-class white gay people, which I don't consider myself to be. I consider myself from a different class. Uh, I think they're ashamed of that. I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that I think is so unique about your voice in this conversation is because you do embrace your working-class background and very much part of it. But also you incorporate it in your work. You don't hide it. None of this. Tell me a little bit about that night at Stonewall. How much of it was working class? How much of it was middle class? How much was it, you know, could you give people a little bit of a sense? Okay, Stonewall was an enormously diverse crowd. That's what was so great about it. Most of my friends that I went there with were from poor working class backgrounds. But when you go there, you could meet people from a million different backgrounds. I mean, and it's the gay life in general is still like that. Uh, but in the Stonewall, it was more concentrated, where, where you, someone could connect to someone. You didn't know anything about these person, people, and they could be like a curator at the Metropolitan Museum or something like right. that. Right. And so now, were trans people part of that world? And if so, what were the were they called cross-dressers? I mean, there were all these terms well, that were called were, before. Were, that term, uh, like the way we use trans today, was not used back then. Right. Back then... The street uh, talk would have just said drag queens. But drag queens, okay, everyone was called queen. Right. Whether you acted like a queen or not, everyone would say, like, oh, shut that queen up over there or something like that. Right. And, and like, but if someone, like, wore women's clothes occasionally or, or all the time, they were a drag queen. I see. So that was kind of the generic term that was kind of used as a catch-all for all these. But what's interesting is that in the street, it was the drag queens who were back in this number, this is back in the mid-60s, that would say when they would, the cops would bother them or something, they would say, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. Now, today, therapists say that. 
Right. It's amazing to think that uh, this was pioneered in the street before it was pioneered in academia. Right. And so now the the people at Stonewall, you're saying it was across different classes, mm-hmm. across different cultures, right. communities. Now, do you think that that was threatening to the at all to the police, or did you see it as so unique, or was that sort of how New York was? I mean, I'd love to get a little well, sense the, of what your the sense. Police is. were were representing the mainstream heterosexual society, which was threatened by everything gay. Right. And and, and so like uh, the police came in, and as far as they were concerned, they were they were like. Uh, you know, going to arrest a bunch of criminals and deviants that they wouldn't have looked at anyone there as like a normal person. Right, right. And so now for you, what was your art like before Stonewall? And what was your art like after Stonewall? And was there a a significant influence on your work? Stonewall influenced my my art, but my art always was on a steady course. Okay. It was always the same basic thing. It was always... Same materials, like Reynolds wraps, Saran wraps, stuff like that. And like, but the rats had something to do with Stonewall, but they had to do with a lot of things. They had to do with street life before Stonewall. Right. And you talk about transfiguration. You talk about the Catholicism Mm -hmm. of your background. That also is very, plays a big part in your work. Oh, sure. Well, the the whole, the whole, all the, see, I'm culturally from a very different world that most people don't have any idea what it is. I mean, it's 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 amazing that I could actually learn to communicate with people from other backgrounds, but that but I think I owe that to like the world, the gay world of the Stonewall back then. That I could meet all these different people because, of, of, to me, with the way I grew up, to talk about you know you know first communions, confirmations, mendicant monks, I mean, that was normal conversation. Right. But most people don't talk about that stuff. Totally. So now, is there a work that you've created that you feel like was specifically influenced by Stonewall? Not exactly. I can never say why, that. Then why do you think that is? Because you'd think somebody had been through such a big event, that might be... No, I, can, I can tie it in with Stonewall, but it wasn't influenced directly by Stonewall. Like, there's a piece I wrote called Mother Stonewall and the Golden Rats. I mean, that's... I was making those Golden Rats. I started making them in, like, 66, 67, maybe. And, and so that's before Stonewall. Then as time goes by, they can connect to Stonewall, but they weren't inspired by Stonewall. Right. So here we are, Tommy, 55 years later. The world has changed a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, you agree, correct? Well, the world has changed a lot, but it still has to keep changing. Because right. like when we think of those laws, like the laws in Florida, see, it's funny, those people that make those laws, I don't think they think about how they're actually supporting the thing they think they're against. Because this way, all their kids leave home and come, all their gay sons and daughters will come to the big cities. And like if, if they had any interest in education and were taught to respect education and culture, they're gonna pursue that in big cities. So it, it solidifies the gay world in a way. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Well, back in, back when Anita Bryant was around. Oh, of course, Anita Bryant. Well, there was a big lull. There was a time when people were thinking gay people were getting too lackadaisical or lazy. And then along comes Anita Bryant, like, and everyone gets together. Right. So you're saying that these are opportunities these for the community. Things. See, a lot of these really dumb parents that, and dumb preachers and stuff like that, they're funny because a lot. Of, some of them are closet cases. Some of them are just totally repressed and don't even know anything about what they are sexually. Right. But they also have kids that go to school, and their kids talk to other kids who talk to other kids and hang out with other kids, and that's where their kids learn who they are. Because if the kid is gay, he starts to know they're gay pretty all soon in life. Probably when you're in like. In your maybe like 12, 13 ish, was when I started to realize it full force. Right. And it's the same, I think, with most of them. Right. So their parents hate them for that. They're just going to not tell their parents anything. So, since you started making art in the mid 60s, how do you feel like the transformation of your heart has happened? And how have you helped sustain yourself to make art through all these years? Because that, of course, is sometimes the biggest trick artists need to learn how to sustain themselves. Well, I'm very lucky to come from a working class background. Because I learned to live on practically nothing. Mm. And I'm also very lucky because I came to New York when the rent stabilization still existed. See, so these things... And I also came to New York when there's a thing called the war on poverty. See, back then, if you had a nervous breakdown, you were put on welfare. 
So how would that work? That well, you had a nervous breakdown. You went to the as people the nut house for a month, and, and that could be Bellevue or on any other places, uh, or any hospital that had a mental section. And then they they gave you food stamps if you needed them, and uh, money to live on every month. So that was like that was welfare more or less. Right. And and uh, that was part of the war on poverty. Mm-hmm. So for a few times in that part of the '60s, I was able to get that. That helped a lot. See, I, I, my art is, is very uh, much like when Karl Marx said, art is unalienated culture. And he also talked about, he always talked about the connection to economics. My whole life is, is directly connected to money, always, and not having it. Ooh, okay. I want to get into that a little yeah. bit, because I think this is a really interesting question, because yeah. I think part of it is, One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because you sort of lived in New York at an incredible period where the professionalization of the art world and all these different threads happened. I'll tell you, part of it is the concern I have going to art schools and Mm -hmm. hearing a lot of young artists obsessing over having a gallery or this vision of success that has to do with showing these very luxury art objects and types of things. Do you see a problem with that kind of thinking? I see a big problem with that because I would would go back to like, Charles Ludlam, he used to say to me, because people like Charles Ludlam and Jack Smith were my main art teacher. And like, uh, I mean, one time I was saying to Charles, I said, I made some art, do you think Henry will like Henry Geld's art? Yeah. And, he, and he said to me, and this was at Henry's house. And so he pulls me in the other room. And he says, what the hell is wrong with you? I said, what do you mean? He said, you're not supposed to make art for them to like. You're supposed to teach them what art is coming from you. Ooh. And he was right. That's good. And I more or less knew that, but I had sidestepped for a few minutes, so to speak, into thinking, I have to please a curator. But I was glad that Charles Ludlam was able to connect me more to who I really was anyway. So can you tell us a little about Charles and Jack, just because you just mentioned them as your art teachers? Yeah. For those people who may not know, especially for younger artists, I, I wonder if you could just describe a little bit about why they were important to you and who they were. Well, first of all, we'll go to Jack Smith. Now... Everyone gay and not gay should also should see a movie called Flaming Creatures. Now, well, they'll see it, but it, they might think it's boring, and it might be boring to them, but it's, <laughs> it's very important. Because contained in Flaming Creatures is the whole era that is going to come about within the next 50 years. It's all about trans people without knowing the word. It's all about people being different sexualities and not conforming to like the way people are told to dress and all these things. And so Jack Smith brings that to New York, makes that in New York. Okay, Charles Ludlam comes to New York a little bit later, meets him, and then there's John Ficaro too. There's all these, they all meet each other. And then they're all genius. I, get to, we, I was supposed to say genii, is the plural, but, pe- <laughs> but people say geniuses today, so I was going to say they're all geniuses. But I was taught the right word, is genii, because in Catholic school we had to say, pray in Latin. That sounds, a, that sounds like a very Catholic school word. Uh, genii, <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Well, that's what I, and I, it's, the, it's the correct right, right. plural, yeah, I, yeah. but no one uses it. So they were all geniuses. Right. But, and, they all disagreed with each other. So they had, Tell me more. I like this. In 67, they were all working together on a play called uh, Big Hotel, I think it was, that was written by Charles Ludman. And this was when I just met, just met Chris Scott. And Chris Scott, again, was Henry Gelsall's boyfriend, but he had been Charles Ludman's boyfriend in high school. And Chris Scott was producing Big Hotel. Okay. They were all working together on that. And then they all had to start to have their input. They all disagreed with each other. Jack Smith was robbing equipment from other people. He'd come in the middle of the night. This, I think this is at the Bowery Lane Theater. And he would rob the lights or something like that. And, and, like, and then Chris Scott would go and complain to him. And then he'd throw Chris Ta- Scott down a flight of stairs. Okay, or something like that. They were all like, there was a lot of violence was happening. Like, not serious death violence, but like scary violence, just the same. Okay, so then Charles Ludlam wrote a play called When Queens Collide that was all about these different queens disagreeing with each other, basically. And it was also called Conquest. It had like 20 different names. <laughs> it's still around. And they, people in colleges play it once in a while. 
But anyway, so they all split apart, and each one was like a great producer of culture. So I was very lucky to just be in that. And in that room with that, too, was Mario Montez, Augusto Machado, all these different people that, like, each one is... I mean, go, have you ever seen Mario Montez? You see Mario Montez, go to YouTube, see Mario Banana. That's a Warhol movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but Mario is what makes it happen. So it sounds like you were part of these different scenes, and uh, some of which didn't get along, it sounds like. Well, I ended up being more part of the Charles Ludlam people. Even though I got along, Jack Smith never did anything wrong to me. But when I go to visit Jack Smith, I'd be very quiet. Got it. And just kind of, like, be there. Because... Uh, Jack Smith could get very angry and, like, throw kitty at literature or something, because that's what he would do. <laughs> and, and Jack Smith was famous for, like, saying, yeah, I think you should leave. And then you go outside and he jumps the kitty litter on your head or something. But he never did that to me. I, I know he did that to people. How uh, catty. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, like, saying, would you like a piece of cake? And then when they go to gravity, he pushes it in their face kind of thing. Ah, uh, uh, so Jack, he was that guy. Jack Smith could be very nasty to people he didn't like. So now, so what was their influence on your work? So it sounds like this was a really rich environment where they were producing culture. But how did it influence the way you saw culture? It did and it didn't. It, conf it more or less confirmed what I already thought. Mm. Because, okay, I was doing a, a piece at my apartment called uh, Summer Palace of Zorina Tatlina. Mm -hmm. And that was really before I knew them very well. So Mario Montez brings Jack Smith there. And Jack Smith was very kind to me, actually. He said, he said, oh, this whole, whole thing looks like it's a Technicolor movie. Mm. And I didn't even know that he was doing something very similar to it. Wow. So that, because, like, there's, there was the art world art back then, was, which was people like Donald Judd. Right. I, I knew I didn't, I could appreciate a Donald Judd, but I didn't like it, really, as art. So, as a gay person, though, did you feel like the art world was open? Was it more gay-friendly, let's say, than other fields? I mean, the what... The art back then was like, it's so crazy. There were always a lot of gay curators, but the art world, most of the artists were straight back then. And, and the, art, well, the, art, the art they showed was, in the art world, was, was very, had all these strict limits on what shouldn't be done. Right. And, like, even though, you know... If anyone knows anything about art, they read art of art history, look at art history and see Van Gogh in relation to the 19th century French ac academics. Well, how does that break with that? And so I figured art, you're supposed to make art that breaks with what's going on. Right. Now, do you remember the first artist that made a big impression on you or the first artwork? Well, when I was a little kid, the first, I would look at art in the library and the, the first, oh, what's his name? Uh, he was a big Dutch genre painter. He painted scenes of, like, bar life and stuff like that. Look up Eve of St. Nicholas. Eve of St. Nicholas. Dutch painting. It's probably 16th century. Jan St Jan Steen. What is it? Jan oh, Jan, Jan Steen, of uh, course. I think, Jan Steen. Yeah, yeah it is. Jan Steen, Feast of St. Nicholas. That's, That's it. it. That's... Okay. What I liked about that was, like, see, when I was a little boy, that was back when, like, uh, who was the illustrator? Norman Rockwell. Right. And, like, white people were always loving Norman Rockwell. I, I never understood that. And, and so I remember I was at the library, and I was looking at a Norman Rockwell, and I was looking at a Jan Steen, and somehow I just knew the difference. It was the Jan Steen just had more, more going on in it. And it was the Eve of St. Nicholas I was looking at. And because, like, people would look at the Norman Rockwell, the one with the, the little kid running away from home. Right. And he has, like, he's sitting on a chrome seat in, like, a, a, a luncheonette. And, like, you look at it and you say, how could Norman Rockwell paint that chrome to look so real? And, like, that's admirable, of course. But, like, um, Jan Steen did it better by making it more complex. He was able to get metallic surfaces to look real. But within the context of the whole painting, they just had more depth. Right. And more layers of things going on. I mean, uh, the, Rock, the Rockwell stuff never got past the actor's acting. It was like they rep. They, it, it was like Rockwell is, a, is like a strange American conceptual artist, actually. Mm. Even though conceptual people would never think that. He well, is, he was also very involved in the civil rights movement at the time. Well, he was. He did a lot of good things, but that doesn't mean we have to like him. No. As all. We don't have to like anyone, actually. <laughs> that all absolutely works. Um, so now, in your own work. I have to say, I feel like you're very unusual to still retain the sort of working class consciousness in your in your own life and your in your well, it's work. Actually, it's the only way I can survive. 
I understand, but a lot of people, they sort of like, especially when they get in the art world, often sort of sheds sheds that. Well, you know, with growing up working class, it's it's very highly unlikely that you'll be supported as an artist that can make a living off of your art. Right. Uh, so so you have to if you're going to hold on to being working class, you just do or you don't. And and like what what some people do from working class backgrounds is they start to make like what I would call the mainstream bourgeois art, right. and then they just become that because they're making That's a lot right. of money from it, That's and right. then they just fit in with that because fitting in with that is wearing a mask of signifiers and always conforming to that. Well, I guess I'm trying to understand why you didn't do that. Because of economics, basically. I, I was never spoiled enough to do that. I mean, if Holly Solomon had been nicer to me, I might have caved in. <laughs> Really? So, so tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> now, Holly Solomon, okay. So the gallerist Holly Solomon. Holly Solomon, her, I, I know a lot of geniuses. Holly Solomon was another genius, and I, I think the movie should be made about her. Oh, I could want to strangle her, believe me, at some time. She could be like <laughs> Ivan the Terrible, but she was a genius. It's the same. But anyway, okay, I make my art where I live. I give it away to people. Now there was a... a and this oh, you is, gave it away a lot. I always gave it away at the oh. beginning. I wouldn't even sell it because I, I was on welfare. Right. So I could afford to do that. Holly Solomon goes to see art at Eddie Shostak's. Eddie Shostak has some of my art. And that's a dealer? No, no. Eddie Shostak is an artist. Oh, okay. He never became very famous, but he was... He was he was very well liked, and I'll tell you this crazy story about him before Holly Song. Um, he got a Guggenheim grant from Henry Gelsauer because Henry Gelsauer robbed his boyfriend, and Eddie Shostak was going to kill Henry Gelsauer, and, and Eddie Shostak said, You give me a Guggenheim, I won't murder you. <laughs> Wait, what? Really? Mm -hmm. That's one way to get a Guggenheim. He got it. <laughs> Okay, now on to Holly. Okay. So we go to... That was a good story, I have to say. Tom. It's true. <laughs> yeah, so Eddie Shostak was another artist. Eddie Shostak was the artist who didn't murder Henry Yelzog, but who had been boyfriends with Christopher Scott. Wait, by the way, was Henry a nice person? Because I've heard mixed things. Henry could be both things. Okay. Henry was, Henry was another genius. Met Henry through Chris. Okay, I met Chris... In 66 or 67, I met him the first time I was going to the Museum of Modern Art. Okay, I go to the Museum of Modern Art. I thought, because I'm very, I was very Rooseveltian, I thought the Museum of Modern Art would, was a public service. I didn't know he had to pay admission. So I didn't go. I just, I walked around the back. I'm walking around the back, where the back of the sculpture garden on the street behind. And then this, guy's walking along in a bomber jacket, another gay guy, and he's giving me the look of sex, right? And and so we became friends, and he lived on 7th Avenue and 56th Street, I think. Did you have sex at least? Sort of. We ended, we, <laughs> no, we ended up talking more. It was crazy. It was, I would meet a lot of people, and we'd just talk, 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 and then we'd hardly ever have sex, and I would end up becoming friends with them. And he was one of those? He, well, it's, like I said, it started out with sex. And he was like sex famous because he had a double beer can two-hander. Oh wow! Yes, uh, that's that's hung like a horse. Yes, <laughs> that's interesting. Yes, okay. but I knew that if you met someone with a double beer can two-hander, you didn't touch their dick. All you do is kiss them, and then they'd become your friend. <laughs> That was the rule I followed. I'm really liking this art history lesson. Well, that was uh, that was the way I met people. I mean, because like, if they had a dick like that, everyone wants to have sex with them. Gotcha. So, like, uh, but nobody wanted to kiss them <laughs> And I liked kissing, so, like, uh, but anyway. Okay, so, but you mentioned that Henry had robbed Eddie's, Edwin's boyfriend. Oh, okay. What's that about? The, boy, the boyfriend is Chris with the double beer can two head. That's Chris Scott. Okay, okay now. Wait, wait, I'm confused. Who, wait, I'll tell you. I'm, uh, wait, who's who? I thought that was Henry, you were saying. Henry Geldzahler. Right is the person who befriends Chris Scott and makes Chris Scott his boyfriend. Chris Scott had been Eddie Shostak's boyfriend, but oh. Henry went to a party. So Chris is the one with who was well hung. Henry went to a party, some art party, that, like, Eddie and Chris had gone to some kind of, like, art party. And, and like, Eddie Shostak was there with his boyfriend, Chris Scott. Okay. And Henry Geldzahler says to Chris... Oh, why don't we go out outside and get a drink or something? And Chris says, well, let me, let me go see Eddie. Should I go with Henry and get a drink? Sure, you go with Eddie and get a drink. Okay, so that night, 
Hank Chris doesn't come back home to Eddie. Oh. And then, then he gets the call the next day and says, hi, I'm in like someplace like the Bahamas. Uh, I'm in Jamaica, the Bahamas, whatever, with Henry. I'm not coming back ever. Oh, so he stole his boyfriend. He stole his boyfriend. Oh. That's more clear now. Yes. Right? yes. So, Henry, so Eddie Shostak decided he wanted to murder Henry Gelsar because he liked the double beer can two-hander. So Henry was a bit of a size queen. Very much so, yes. Okay, so so like, so like when I met Chris, I'm at his house, and Henry, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know what a curator was. And, and like, I you know, go to this apartment with Chris, and, and like there, there's like a lot of Warhols there. I thought it was fake art made by art students, but it was all the real thing. Right. It was Brillo boxes, all this stuff. And Henry was out doing some lecture tour or something. And like, and then he comes home, and that's how I meet Henry. But Henry hated me at first. But then, slowly, he just started to like me, like my art, whatever. So what did he say about your art? What, what, yeah, did he encourage you? Time. Not at first. And later on, like once, once, like, uh, you know, after, after it got a few reviews that had nothing to do with him, I said, well, what do you think of my art? And he said, it's too avant-garde. Interesting. And I said, what does that mean? He said, you'll find out as time goes by. I think he was right. Wow, okay, that's... that's he, was a, yeah. he was a genius at diplomacy. Right. So that's, a, that's one of those statements that is on a seesaw of whatever. That's funny. So, like, I'm friends with Chris, I'm friends with Henry, I'm friends with Chris. Okay, so they're part of that. That's Charles Lowell too. Okay, so that's all, like, these people I'm friends with. And I'm 18 years old, right? Okay, now, get, but we, we want to go to Holly Solomon. Okay. Holly had had her portrait done by Warhol. It's one of the best things Warhol ever did. You gotta see it. Oh, I have. It's great. It's one of the. It's probably the best portrait ever did. And that everything you want to know about Holly is in that portrait. She could be a genius at interaction. Mm. She could also be Satan incarnate, but she could also be a beloved saint at the same time. She was that crazy and that fascinating. So now we're in the 70s. She goes to Eddie Shostak's loft to see his art. Because she's a collector. Sure. She didn't have a gallery yet. So what year is this we're talking about? I would say early 70s, maybe 71, something like that. So Eddie Shostak didn't want her to see my art when she was there. So he threw it all in the bathroom. (laughs) So Holly Solomon goes to his house, and she has to make a number two. So like she has to use the bathroom. So she comes out of the bathroom and says, Dad, who made that rat? Those rats in there. And... Eddie was nice enough to, to call me up and ask who I wanted to meet her. Mm. He, could have t- he could have cut the whole thing off. Right. He, could have been, right. he just could have been a bitch and said, oh, that's some dead queen or something. Right, right, right. But he, he, no, he didn't. <laughs> and, and so, like, Polly Solomon calls me up. Okay. And, like, I didn't know anything about her. She sounded very affected, I thought. Right. She was very grand and crazy in her talk. She would do stage whispers all the time. You know, so she was, and I would shoot down the phone. And her husband's name was Horace. And I'm on the phone with her, and all of a sudden she goes, Horace is quite a guy. I said, why are you whispering? And who's Horace? Who's Horace? He said, Horace is quite a guy. She wouldn't tell me. And I said, why are you whispering? She said, I'm not whispering. But she was. And so I thought, this person's crazy. So she said, can I come over and see your art? So I said, okay, lady, you can come over and see my art. But do not come over here wearing jewel, big jewelry and a fur coat because I lived in a very dangerous neighborhood. And where were you then? Yeah, uh, Fourth Street between B and C, which was solid junkies back Got then. It. It. it was like you could get murdered any time of the day back then. Right. It's New Yorkers, like white people, New Yorkers can't imagine what that was like back then. Right, right. It was just so unbelievable. So we arrange a day for her. She comes over, she's wearing like a, a little bush skirt. And, and a woolen coat and acting like, like, kind of simpering, like, like that. And I thought, because she's an actress, right? She's still acting. She saw it with, with Lee Strasberg. Right. And uh, there's another story attached to that that other people will tell you at other times. But anyway, so she dressed the right way. So she comes in and she buys a few rats. And so that's the first art I really sell, right? Oh, wow. She opens her gallery in 75. Before that, she asked me if I want to be in a gallery. She's going to open. Okay. So that's how I got in her gallery. Well, I had talked to her on the phone, and I said, listen, lady, don't wear fur coats and don't wear jewelry. She didn't let me know, but she didn't like the way I said that. Mm. But she came over. She listened to it anyway. But then 
many years past, many, many years. And it's in the 1990s. Remember, this happens in the 1970s. In the 1990s, she comes to visit me here. She's walking in the door downstairs where you came in. Mm -hmm. And she says, I smell smoke. And she's making her little nose is moving a certain way. And, and like, uh, I said, I don't see smoke. And she's telling there's smoke over there. This so she's coming out of the basement. And, and like this crazy southern white woman on the first floor opens the door and says, that's nothing. That's just the Chinese people in the basement cooking food. And Holly said, why are they locked in the basement? Because there's a padlock on the basement, right? So Holly said, I'm sorry, I think there's a fire down there. So she said, where's the fire department? I said, so go around the corner. So we go running to the fire department. And Holly Solomon, I thought she's going to go to the desk and say, excuse me, sir, like working class people. Do. Excuse me, sir, there's a fire in the building around the corner. Can you help us? No, no. This time she is wearing a fur coat and jewelry. And she runs into the, the where they're playing, like, uh, you know, cards and, and making Irish stew. And she goes, men, fire! And they all stand up <laughs> like she's Queen fucking Elizabeth. And, and like... Uh, and then, and she holds her arm up there. I think she had an umbrella. She holds up in the air, and, and we're crossing 8th Avenue, and they're behind her like she's the queen of the world with their fireman outfits on. And then in the middle of 8th Avenue, she turns to me and she says, See, Tom? And I said, What? She goes, It pays to know women who wear fair coats and jewelry. Oh, wow. She, how long has she weighed? That's like right. 30 years. <laughs> wow. So she, was, she, she kept that in. Yes. And <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, that's, that's funny. How, that's, the, yeah, that's the best example I can give of her personality. So now, how about one, one thing? I loved you talking a little bit about the gay community in the art community, mm -hmm. you know, and the gay subculture, I guess, within art. So I wonder what role that played in your life in general and in your work. And I mean, I wonder if there are other characters within that milieu that sort of really influenced you, maybe during the 80s or. Well, when I, Holly Solomon was homophobic. Really? Oh, yes. I mean, she was she was the kind of person, she was a white liberal who would have told her kids not to call gay people fags, but, like, she wouldn't have wanted them to be around. Her. She didn't want to have anything to do with gay art. Like, so that was that true generally in the art world then? Yeah. They would never say it publicly. They just would say, it was done in that waspy way. You just ignore something to death. Right. So do you think that's still true? It must be true some places. I mean, I have to well, say... I say yeah. she's homophobic, there's always people who say she, she said she wasn't, but she was. And then she didn't, she didn't stop being homophobic until the 90s, when Dr. Brian Saltzman and all these other gay people who were like, you know, high up people that she knew were gay and were proud of them. That's interesting. But how about like some other people like in the 80s? Were there any um, artists then or any part of your kind of gay community that, you know, kind of like we talked about Henry and these other characters in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Was there anybody influencing you then? Because I know there was a lot of activism and a lot of transformations in the gay world well, in the 80s. I was always on my own with my, just my own set of ideas and wherever I got them from. Hmm. You know, there were never any other people except, except the people I knew, like from the 60s, basically. Right. And then Holly's Gallery was practically all heterosexuals. And so now, were there any, like, curators at that time or art writers that, that sort of were interested in gay art or uh, gay artists? No. They never would go near it. They would never go near it being talked about. They might go near it as a sensibility unnamed. Mm. In other words, they would like my art because of... of the prettiness and different things. So when did that change, you think, at all? It starts to change in the 90s. And so what do you, do you think there was an event or there was an exhibition or something that well, may I have... I remember, like, there was a show, I, I forget when it was, with Dan Cameron, and it was at the New Museum. This was earlier in the 90s, I think. It was one of the first shows at the New Museum when it was on 14th Street. It's a long time ago, so if you can find out when that was... That was the first gay identity show. And, and did that change things for gay artists? It started to change. It started, it started to become a category like black. Right. And so now what did you, when you saw that show and you started, did you ever think of yourself as, uh, as a gay artist in that way? Or was that something that, you know, was something that formed later? I always thought of myself as a gay artist and an artist at the same time. But my art connects to gay street people the same way it connects to working class people. Because right. the gay street aesthetic is very similar to a working class aesthetic. Right. And in the 80s after that show, did you think that the context for, did the audience understand your work better? Well, in my art, there's always there's many ways people enter into it. Mm. And like as long as they enter into it, I'm happy. I, I mean, uh, 
they don't have to like what I make it for. Right. If they like it, I'm happy. So now, fast forward to the 21st century, yeah. the last 23 years. How has it changed for you in making your work? I mean, the art world has become more professionalized. I mean, you've had a major retrospective at MoMA PS1 mm -hmm. about a decade ago. How has that transformed anything, or has it? Well, it's turned the art world into more of a, that thing you were talking about with people going to school and saying they have to meet a gallery owner or something like that. Right. It's become more of a thing that is, you know, I won't say it's academic. There's not a word for it. Because, okay, if we say it's academic, then people start to say, well, it's not academic the way the 19th century French Academy was, which is true. But it is, well, in, it a is sense, in a sense that, like, there's a lot of do's and don'ts. Right. And there's a lot of signifier games that go on. Right. Uh, there's a lot of ways of a person, if a, like a, a, a girl or a boy walks into a gallery, if they're dressed a certain way, they'll get paid attention to. Right. That's all signifier games. Right. And, I, and I think that's disgusting. Because it, it will give entree to people that are only looking the part. Right. And so so did your art change as a result of like being aware of this? Or how has yeah, your art changed art, in the last two couple of decades? My art just keeps developing what it is. But how would you describe it for someone who doesn't know your work? Because I, I, I have a feeling a number of people listening to this will for the first time discover your work mm -hmm. or know. How would you describe your work having transformed well, over the actually, years? Actually, I would have to res go resort to the, the cliche that most people do. And you have to see it because art is visual. But this is a podcast, so it's audio too. So how would you describe it to the people? Oh, like in terms of like, in terms of, do you think it got bigger? Did it become more complicated? Were there were there images that have sort of um, stayed stayed forever um, that you keep struggling with or maybe thinking through? I mean, I guess I, I think it would be great for people well, to hear to that. Well, speaking in terms that would be more like school terminology, uh, my art is about the psychology of color and the impact of the way color is contained in certain materials. In other words, I identify more with certain 60s painters, but I don't use paint. Mm. I mean, the painters, these painters like Morris Lewis, mm -hmm. those drip painters. Yep, the color fields. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I use a lot of plastic. All plastic is some kind of dry liquid. Right, acrylic or something. Yeah, and so, like, what I make is, is basically a way that color is contained in a way that is not contained in paint. So the colors are actually different. Mm. You know, it's very sad. If you go to an art school and you walk, like they have art exhibits in the hallways, like the first year students and everything, first year painting or something, mm -hmm. fourth year painting, you walk down through there, it smells the same, everything looks the same. And like, it's because those companies make those paint tubes. That's nothing like Ang and those people used. They mix their own paint and they had got, you know, Holbein, those people, they got colors that don't even exist today anymore. And they don't exist because everyone believes in those tubes. And that's fucked up. And, and like, and then, you, and so you walk past this stuff and you say, well, this person can draw good, but it's not very interesting because the way it's held together is exactly the same way to the same color combinations. That those, you know, phthalo green, blah, blah, blah. I mean, all those, those tubes of paint, acrylic, oil, whatever, it all looks the same. Right. So now, how about um, now with the way the world, uh, the art world has changed? I mean, do you still regularly go see exhibitions? I mean, what is your... I can't go out. I can't go out at all. I can't manage the stairs in the building. Right. So then, you're, do, are you on the internet? Yeah, but if I have, it just finally broke down completely the other day. So I'm waiting to get a new computer. And then, so then, how do you feel like you experience the world now? I experience, well, most of the world I experienced. Got it. You know, I'm part of a generation that's rooted in the past. And so now, how do you think that's influenced your work? Because I have to say, I mean, I'm looking around, there's so much of your work or things related to your work here. I mean, it's pretty glorious, no. you know, to sort of see the, this, this going, on. going on. These things. Oh, wow, these plates with, like, cows and... Like and... Yeah. Because I get meals on wheels, and they have those cows come on the milk. So, so like, uh, I want to do those, like... It's supposed to have the Warhol wallpaper with the cows hung behind it, actually. Because it's supposed to be cows had revisited. <laughs> did you get that? Yeah, I did. You no, know, most people don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, you know, there's something really joyful about your work. I mean, would you characterize it that way? Yes and no. 
I, it's like I, I love that. That's your answer to almost everything. Yes and no. I mean, I love I love that because that's actually I, I feel it in your work and and the way you sort of answer it. But I just love you to talk about that a little. Well, it's joyful, but it's also pretty manic if you look at it. But it's like celebratory oh, still, yeah. even with the manic. You know, it's celebratory, but but there's it's it's like actually it's what it's a, to, it's whatever people get out of it. But what is it? What are you celebrating? I'm celebrating me not going totally crazy and killing myself. <laughs> that's that, why I made it. That's pretty dark, Tommy. That's, that's very dark. You want to hear dark. You say, <laughs> you say it's selfish. You say something else. What am I supposed to say? No, no, no. Say say whatever you need, but I'm just sort of, you know, because yeah, that's why the celebration. supposed to say like one of those middle class no. things? No, 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 no. I want you to say it, but I'm understanding because we're talking about the celebratory part. That's why I'm sort of interested. Well, I wanted to commit suicide since I was 12 years old and I haven't done it. Well, I'm glad you haven't. Because I think well, you've given us so much to all many of us. Well, that I don't do because I make art. Right. I mean, and that breaks so many rules that people can't stand to hear that. You're supposed to take some kind of drug to keep from doing that. I'm actually just surprised because you've been very sort of frank and honest, and so many artists are putting up putting up different sort of airs. So it's, if anything, if I'm reacting, it's because of that, because I sort of appreciate your sort of blunt honesty. Well, ever since, when I was like um, in 1959, I would go to Mass every day because... The Pope was, this was crazy back then, and Catholics were, Pope Pius XII, okay, maybe it's earlier than 59, well, whatever, Pope Pius, John XXIII, one of those popes, they were supposed to open a letter in 1960. They were supposed to, like, we were as little kids, we were led to believe that the, the letter was going to, it was from Our Lady of Fatima. Do you know anything about yeah. her? Okay. She gave this letter to the children of Fatima. Okay. So that's like a big deal when you're in Catholic school back then, because we were all children. So, you know, we were thinking we could have apparitions, whatever. But ever, the way the rumor got around among Catholics was the world was going to end in 1960. So I was going to Mass every day in 1959, thinking that on 1960, on New Year's Day, I was going to be in heaven. Mm. And like, uh, but I, I was just totally dead serious about that. But it was going to be a joyful occasion to be dead and in heaven. Mm. It didn't happen. So, so like... Uh, Ever since then, there's been like, uh, but I haven't, I mean, I haven't thought about killing myself since probably high school. Got it. You know, because I was able to find a place where I wouldn't be killing myself. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yes. And so now, plates seem to play a big role in your work and different kinds of sort of like these things. I know you talk about this. Plates are home, they're easy. And they're a good solid form. These are tondos. Right. Yes, right. so they'll hold it. They'll hold. I don't remember the piece that made of the lasagna pan. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that, those are ways. To, that's a formalist method to hold the piece together. It also has metaphorical associations. Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, it's important because that piece wouldn't have held together the same way. It was just a bunch of pieces of paper with those pictures on it. I guess I'm also trying to understand what role meals and, and food had in your family, because often we sort of bring these things forward. Well, so. in working class families, yeah. food is very central. Right. It's central because it's, it's viewed as part of the economy of living. Right. And also just a way that families come together and right. sort of celebrate and not deal with their emotions sometimes <laughs> and different things. Well, I don't know about your family, but somehow at our family, there's a lot of emotions dealt with at dinner time. Well, there was a lot of emotions, too, but sometimes those are kind of performative emotions that kind of kind of go around. So I don't know. Well, my mother had, you know, those little paddles that you have to have the ball on it on the rubber yes. band. Yep. My mother had a few of those and she would always have it next to her. She'd, she'd throw it across the table. And, you know, my sister, <laughs> no. <laughs> so when you grew up in Catholicism, is that something you retain later? Or was that something that you sort of shed as soon as you ran to New York? Both. Mm. No, I, I mean, it's like, I'm like most Catholics. They retain, retain things about it. And like, you know, the church is crazy because like, I don't know, you're Armenian. Mm -hmm. So Armenian church is... Similar. Well, I actually went to a Catholic church in... Uh, it's a Catholic school in Toronto, so... so. Then you know it. Yeah. But you're a post-Vatican II person. Yes, I'm a post-Vatican II. That's okay, it. now before Vatican II, everyone was told... Now, we were all immigrant families, yeah. right? So everyone's told, you eat meat on Friday, you're going to hell. You eat meat on Friday, you're going to hell. Then after Vatican II, they say, you can eat meat on Friday all you want. And so what happens to those people that were in hell already? You're, to, to, <laughs> according to the Catholic Church, you can't get out of hell. So they're, they're stuck in hell because they did something that if they would have waited a day or two. Uh, All for the meat. Well, it's just crazy. I mean, they're, they're so, so, like, apply that to any rule they have. And, and like, uh, they can get, they can, if they want to approve gay marriage, they could do it like that. Right. So did you start going to church at all when you moved to New York? 
I went mostly to Orthodox churches after because they were just prettier. Interesting. So you went to go see the interiors or to, for the masses or what? I actually what you... converted. You converted? To be Russian Orthodox. So you're actually Russian Orthodox fully? Sort of. I'm both. Okay. I'm Catholic and Orthodox. I mean, because they're, they're both crazy. Right. But the Orthodox have a better aesthetic at this right. point. You know, it's crazy. If the Catholic Church created the aesthetics of the Counter-Reformation, and then along comes Vatican II, and they become like the dullest moronic people in the world, what the fuck is wrong? I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> they're a, a, a place that actually creates culture just like methodically abandons it like a ho-hum. Right. And, and like it has the ugliest churches in the world now. Right. With yeah. nothing in them. Funny. And the Orthodox have to have pictures. It's one of their rules. So where do you think the best place for your art is? Where's the best context for your work? Like in a perfect world, if you could have like your piece in a, whether it's a church or in a home or in a museum or a specific uh, museum, all where would it be? The, all of the above. But in a perfect world, I, I would just go to someone and say, I need this amount of money to live. They give it to me. And, and then whoever likes my art would look at it and they could buy it or could be shown in a museum, whatever. I just think that cultural things should just happen. You sound like a socialist, Tommy. Are you? Partly. I guess I am, but I wouldn't get along with them either. <laughs> At least I remember them from the 60s when, when, right. when my brother was a big socialist. And he, he was like, a, you know, he went to the University of Chicago. He was big in their different socialist organization. And, and like, I, he, and this is like, in the 60s, I asked him what he thought about me being, being gay. And he said, uh, he goes, oh, um, the organization, whatever you call it, hasn't come to a conclusion on that yet. So I turned to him, I said, George, I said, you're just a Catholic with a different name now. Because he runs up by following rules like there's a pope of socialism or something. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, that's really No, the good. left used to be horrible to gay people. Now, now they're like everyone else. You know, they're nice of the nice of the not the not. Interesting. So now I'd love to ask you also a little bit of advice you'd give to young artists. Because I think, you know, I have a feeling your work is going to be more influential sort of as, as time goes on, just because I think you sort of introduce a lot of new ideas into sort of making work and how you make it. Thank you. What, what, would you, what would you recommend, like, to a young artist that's just getting started, maybe even from a working-class background? Well, what I would tell them is something that a lot of times doesn't help them because it doesn't make them conform to what galleries want. Mm. I tell them to find out what their basic aesthetic is that connects to them by who they are and that means where they come from and everything mm. and to create something that has everything to do with that and like sometimes they do that and then no one pays any attention to them so then they tell me how they hate me that, that had that happen and so how do you sustain yourself because i mean i agree with you and what you're saying but I think the tough part for young artists is that they get ignored a little bit, right? And, and sometimes it comes later. They get ignored, but if they're serious and they want to stick with it, uh, unless they have a family that's going to support them, they have to somehow keep a way to keep, arrive at a way to keep their expenses low right. so they don't owe things to people they don't know. Right. And, um, and then find the most important thing, and this Chris Scott told me this way back. That was the beer can, two can double. But he, he had a good. I love that you keep repeating that. Well, he had a, I had to remind. He had a very good brain. He said he was. He, he was. A, he had more than a good brain. It sounds like. Well, he had, he had that huge schlong. But but like uh, but he was also a good person. No, he was very good to me, because he he said the most important thing among artists is to find art families. And so, do you feel like you found yours? Yeah. There's a few people that I connect to, mm. and, and they come and go. But, like, back there, mostly, the art family existed mostly back in the 60s and 70s. What advice would you have given your younger self now? I would say the most important thing is the economy of survival. Mm. Economy in both definitions, economy and mon monetary, mean mon money-wise, and economy, how you distribute your, the weight of your talent in your life and how you, how you place that so you have the maximum amount of time and energy to do your art. So now what do you think the influence of Stonewall has been on the, on the art world? Well, the art world was totally cowardly about Stonewall. Now it's, it's finally caved in and just accepts it the way, the way the world world does. So wait, wait, how was it cowardly? Oh, the Stonewall, back when Stonewall happened, the art world couldn't give a shit. The art world didn't acknowledge it in any way, shape, or form until the 90s. 
and with Dan Cameron and some of the others. And those people, and like finally had, it was a, di- a different group of curators and people had to come along. Right. And so now, do you think people really understand what Stonewall was about nowadays? Do you think the art world has finally embraced it fully? That depends on individuals. Everyone's going to perceive it in a different way. Well, I guess part of it is I'm asking because the art world has a way of sanitizing. Uh, yes, but Stonewall now is up there with like Martin Luther King's speeches. It's something right. that that liberals just think they're going. They just pay mouth service to it and try to maybe read up before they visit someone or something on what they can say about it. Has the art world become more right wing, or was it always have that out? The art world was always very right wing. The art world is is like a, is, it's probably like the arch propaganda institute of the right wing. So then why do you still make art? Because those are, they are, those are the people that will show it and buy it. See, there, it's crazy. Those people need things that are outside of their sensibilities. They re, it's the people who respect great achievement sometimes are horrible people. Sometimes they're good people. Mm. But like, okay, here's an example. Okay, Asher Edelman bought my art. Okay, he's a Yep. A Wall Street person. He helped me a lot of times. He did good things for me. So, see, there's this, this, this balance that goes on that we can't just blankly say, especially I get older. People say as people get older, they get more conservative. I don't get more conservative, but I get more tolerant of conservatives. I don't, I don't necessarily like their politics. I don't like their politics. And I think it's horrible what's happened in this country. That like it, that it's so hard to get like for someone to get like welfare today or something like that. Is there an artwork that you keep returning to? Yeah, Janstein, the Eve of Saint Nicholas. So that work still speaks over to you over and over and over again because that that's he was Catholic in a Protestant culture. Okay, but that I didn't know when I saw it. That I didn't find out until years later. That picture probably represents a Catholic family because the little girl in it is holding a doll that looks like a baby Jesus. It's, it's not really a doll. It's like a saint statue. Mm-hmm. So a Protestant can look at it and say she has a doll. But if you look at the picture closely, it has a halo and it has a certain way of, that's put together that is a saint statue. Right. So I, I like that kind of reveal-conceal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so like... Uh, uh, I take artists from every era and like them. And again, back to people like uh, that tubes of paint with those awful colors coming out of them. And you look at a Holbein or you look at any of those painters. Uh, like, uh, just think, Leonardo da Vinci, they made their own paint. And they made it from ground up things that somehow they figured out how to do it. And then we're supposed to feel like it's a great breakthrough because, like, Vincent van Gogh used tubes of paint. And then from then on, it's like shit. <laughs> so is there anything you'd like to add? Or maybe you have a question for me, or there's something we haven't talked about you'd like to bring up? I just want to give you that opportunity. Well, what I would say, see, what I would say, see, like, the best thing about gay street life was the transcendent profundity of what seems to be a cliché. And, and uh, I would tell people... I would say people, just try to be yourself for who you really are and, and, like, not wear those masks of becoming someone else. Good and, advice. And, and hopefully people can stick with that. And, like, every time you meet anyone, this constantly come, is challenged to think like that. And the easiest way to connect to the art world is not through your arts. It's just to look like one of those stupid people who hangs out in the art world. Get all those clothes and get the haircut that goes with it and everything, and go in a gallery. And then if you're and if you're young and they want to be around a young person just because they're young, they'll hang out with you. But that doesn't do anything for your art. And they'll also want you to make art that looks just like it's supposed to look to them. So let's say a young artist, uh, this is my final question, was saying, you know what, I want to continue what Tommy's doing in, in his work. What would that what would that look like to continue the work you created and the legacy you're leaving? That would totally depend on their sensibility. They, they're themselves. They're not me. So, so, so what they get out of my work is unique to the interaction with them. They're coming from a different cultural space. They're coming from a place where materials are used in their home growing up a certain way. 
that is not the way they were. Okay, in my art, there's the aluminum foil mm -hmm. and there's saran wrap. Mm -hmm. Okay, when I was growing up, we didn't wrap our sandwiches in that. We used wax paper because my father said those things are too expensive. Oh, wow. So to me, they're like valuable right. materials. Right. Okay, and then it connects to sexual desire. Mm. When I was in the fifth grade, there was another altar boy. His name was Eddie, and he was in high school. And like, we were sitting eating our lunch. We had we both served a funeral mess in the middle of the morning at the church, and then it was going to. The priest said, "You can eat your lunch here in the sacristy," and there was going to be another funeral soon after that. So we're sitting there eating our lunch, me and this Eddie guy, and we're looking in the garbage can, and there was all the garbage from the flower pots and things that were used on the altar. And that's when I first saw gold aluminum foil. Mm. And Eddie, who had these very big, beautiful, masculine hands, takes the gold foil out of the garbage can and makes a little chalice with it. And he was so handsome. And, and like, there was no other way for me to articulate any connection to him but just to see him. And, and so this was kind of a sacramental connection. That's beautiful. See, because like I couldn't say to my parents, I didn't even have to say back then, I think Eddie's sexy. No, no, no. I didn't even know that those were the exact thoughts back then. I was like 12 or 13. Right. And what was your church? St. Elizabeth of Hungary in Linden, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do a nice thing for me, mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to get to that church. You can look it up online. Yeah. They have, you look at a picture of the church, they have in front of the church on their walk, high sidewalk in front of the church, they have this big cross. Yeah. Okay, it's maybe like four feet high. And that was the cross that was on their old church that got torn down in like the early 60s. I was the one who saved that cross from the junkyard. Wow. And then when my mother died, it was at my mother's house, and they gave it to the people next door, the Darlankos. And the Darlankos gave it to the church. So there's a little tag beneath it that says, and the Darlankos donated that. That's fine with me. But I want that church to know that I was the one who found that cross. So I, you found it in a garbage dump? Where did you no, find no, it? No, no, no. It was the, the church was torn down. Got it. It was the dump, all the, the torn down church pile of stuff. Gotcha. Okay, there was so the, in the ruins. In the ruins of the church, I went in there, and, and there was the janitor from the, um, the church and the school. What was his name? I forgot his name. Was, oh, I don't remember. But, like, I said... How can I get the cross? Because the cross was the cross that was in the little steeple they had. Mm -hmm. When you looked at it from the ground, it looked like it was around this big. It was actually like four or five feet high. Oh, wow. Yeah. So why did you have that urge to save that cross? Just because I liked it. Hmm. And, and like, but what was interesting, that cross was in the, in the tower, was attached to a beam, a big, thick beam of wood that went up all the way from the bottom. So he had to saw it off and give me the cross. And the cross was light enough, heavy enough that I could carry it home. So I carry it home like Jesus carrying the cross. And my parents' house was only a block away, two block and a half away from church. So my sisters loved telling that story about me carrying the cross down the street when I was like 12, I think. It's the same. It was pretty much the same. So it was a little later than the Eddie story. Because I was, I think I was in high school in Elizabeth. When they, whenever they tore down St. Elizabeth's old church. So, but I want them to know that I saved that cross. So it sounds like you're always trying to save things from, from destruction, it sounds what like. What I'm saying with this is that, like, the art world, for all it's bad, has done good. It's, it's helped me to survive, mm. even though it can be the most evil, stupid, horrible place at times. <laughs> well, like you were saying, it's a little bit of both, right? Is there anything else you want to add? No, but I have nothing I can think of. Can you think of anything? I mean, I, I could talk to you for a long time. So, I mean, I could think of a lot of things, but I want to sort of just kind of give you an opportunity if there's something you want to bring up. Well, the most important things to me are things like the materials and the, the thing about wax paper, because that makes a big difference. Absolutely. Because, like, otherwise I couldn't look at these materials the way I do. Because they're, they're, those are, like, expensive materials to me. Thank you, Tommy, for your time. And uh, it's a pleasure to kind of get to know you in your home. Right. This was a pleasure. Well, thank you. I had a very nice time. And I hope, I hope some of that has meat for thought, food for thought, whatever the word is. I think people are going to be thinking about this for a while. And uh, I think you've given us a lot of insight well, into this. Well, you're going to edit this, right? Well, I don't know. You're pretty good. 
I, don't, I never know if I'm good or I'm not. I mean, it's like, you know, the first, the, you know what I did the first one was going to be on the radio? Oh, did you ever hear of Minette? Yeah. Okay, Minette, I met, I met Minette back in the early 60s. So Minette said, oh, Tommy, come on, be on the, be, come around and take you to BAI. That was, that, yep. you know, that station. Yep. Okay, so we're there and I'm there with Charles Love and Minette. I was so intimidated by that. I didn't say anything. So no one even knew I was there. It was my own stupid <laughs> fault. <laughs> I love it. Well, Tommy, people know you're here now. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. Our membership is the main supporter of our podcast. So thank you so much to all the hyperallergic members out there. I'm Harag Vartanian, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Hyperallergic. We'll see you again very soon.